Getting 100% completion is a staple in every LEGO video game. Whether that be to see what secrets you can unlock or to just see that sweet 100% save file on the menu. Going for 100% has always been one of my favorite parts about LEGO games. So I decided to take things to the next level and 100% complete and review every single LEGO video game. Starting with LEGO Star Wars The Video Game and ending with The Skywalker Saga makes up 27 games. I knew before starting this it was going to be a long and tedious process. But oh boy, I sure did underestimate how hard it would be. So if you've ever wondered what the reward would be for getting 100% or what it takes 100% a LEGO game, then stay tuned and witness me unlock every single character, find every single mini kit, collect all the red bricks, and get tons of studs. And this all started with... LEGO Star Wars The Video Game, or for short, LEGO Star Wars, is the first installment to Traveler's Tales LEGO Video Game series. It released on March 29th, 2005, and was a surprising smash hit that brought Traveler's Tales into the spotlight. This game is based off the Star Wars prequel trilogy, and actually released before the last film, so for fans that just couldn't wait to see how the prequel trilogy was going to end, they could play this game and get a glimpse at how things play out. But anyways, let's start the game. Once we start a new game, we are introduced to the hub, Dexter's Diner. This location is based off a scene from episode 2 and I do quite like it. The diner brings in this nice and comfortable feeling, especially as you unlock more characters and start to see it fill out. In this hub, you can access all the levels, purchase characters or extras, and view vehicles. There isn't really much to do outside of that, but it makes a good first impression and is always a nice place to come back to after completing levels. I mean, you can go outside to the parking lot, but the only thing you could do there is look at vehicles you've unlocked or start fights with other characters. This hub may be small, but it's a nice one with lots of charm and it's quite memorable. But now it's time to talk about the levels. In the story mode, before and after every level, there will be a cutscene that helps tell the story. These are some of the best parts about this game. They all have their own charm, being filled with lots of comedy and taking some liberties when telling the story to make it more kid friendly. It relies entirely on grunts and mumbles since the game has no dialogue, which definitely made it stand out more, and made them be a bit more creative when getting certain story segments across. This being the first LEGO game, the levels mechanics are all quite simple. That's not a bad thing at all though. You give it a set number of characters and must solve puzzles and fight enemies until you get to the end of the level. In the levels, you'll be smashing stuff, doing the force on different objects, accessing panels, and collecting studs. The levels are all designed really well and look like they were ripped straight from the films they are based on. Almost every level in the first episode is good. It basically acts like an introduction to the mechanics and all the different abilities a character may have. You have Jedi's, they can use the force, jump high, and fight with lightsabers. Blasted characters can shoot enemies from afar and use grapples. And loads of other characters that can do all different things, like small character doors, droid panels, or jumping high. The first episode also works as a tutorial for the lightsaber combat. Lightsaber combat is pretty simple, just a 3 hit combo, but if you press the buttons at the right time, you can do a special combo that does more damage. You can also deflect bullets by holding down the attack button, but if you hold down the button as soon as they shoot at you, it'll deflect the bullet right back at the enemy. If you don't learn this early in the story, by the time you're on the last level, you'll need to know how to do it to get past the first section. I love how they teach you how to do it by the end of the game, but the combat is fun and simple. The most interesting it ever gets is when fighting droidicas, you have to do a Jedi slam to take out their shield. The levels all have quite a bit of platforming and puzzle solving. Platforming can be fun, but it's never too complicated or difficult. The puzzle solving, on the other hand, is one of my favorite aspects about this game. Most levels just have you going into different rooms with lots of puzzles to solve. Solving puzzles are the key to progressing further in the levels or can help you find some of the hidden collectibles. This encourages the player to explore and replay the levels once they unlock free play mode. To switch things up, this game has vehicle levels. The one that sticks out the most to me is pod racing, but it does not control all that well. Trying to turn feels rough and each section is split up making the pacing feel really off. If you mess up even a little bit, you must watch a cutscene and restart the section you were just at, making this race more exhausting than fun. The other vehicle levels are okay, they're just auto-scrolling sections and are really forgettable. The only thing I like about the pod racing level is that you can get some really high speeds, and I 100% completed it on my first try. There will also be some boss fights, but none of them are really all that unique. It's just force an object back at them and hit them a couple of times. 
My favorite levels in this whole game are probably the Geonosis battle and the Musafar fight. At the start of the Geonosis battle, you must save your friends by doing puzzles. Once this is over, you fight huge hordes of droids in the battle arena. And then you have a final boss against Jango Fett. He's pretty easy, but it's still really cool. I have countless memories of playing this level over and over again as a kid. The Musafar fight is iconic. You start off by doing platforming, and then work together while the building is falling apart, and have an awesome battle at the end. Depending on who wins, the cutscene will even be different. These levels and so many more are so much fun, especially while playing through them in story mode with a friend. A lot of these puzzles were designed with multiplayer in mind, so you can swap between different characters at any time, which you'll need to do quite often because some characters have exclusive abilities. Or if you have a friend who wants to play, they can just drop in at any time. Drop in and drop out co-op was not common at all during this time. In most games, if you wanted to play multiplayer, it was its own mode, or you had to go all the way back to the menu just to add another player. No matter what is going on, a second player can just drop in at any time during this game. It's a pretty revolutionary feature, and something that TT has kept in every single LEGO title developed by them. But there are some levels I just dread playing. Retake the Palace is a level I just find way too long, and it doesn't help that not long before this level, we were in the exact same location. But this level does have a lot of puzzles, and it's really cool playing as a huge party of characters and having access to tons of different abilities. Another level I just don't like playing is Defensive Kashyyyk. It's a really boring level, I don't find the setting appealing at all, and I'm stuck playing as Yoda, who is not fun to play as. Like when he doesn't have his lightsaber out, he's incredibly slow, but when he does have it out, he bounces all over the place. The only cool thing about him in this game is his floating chair. It's sad this is the only game it's ever in, it's not even in the Skywalker Saga. But overall, the levels and going through the story mode is a lot of fun, even if it's very simple when compared to new titles. Each level evokes this childlike wonder, like wondering what happens if I do the force on these chairs, or if I break this object. It's always keeping you engaged and giving you new things to do. The gameplay is so fun for kids and adults, and it's so easy for anyone to just pick up. Now after the story mode is complete, this is where we can start to track everything we need for 100% completion. In every level, there are 10 mini kits to collect and a stud meter to fill. There are 17 levels in this game, so that means there is 170 mini kits and 17 stud meters. We also have to buy every single item in the shop, so all 31 playable characters, all 10 extras, and all the hints. And finally, complete the bonus level. To fill the stud meter, you simply have to collect a certain amount of studs until it is filled. I made sure to do this while playing through the story mode, so by the time I was done with that, I already had all the stud meters filled. And once you fill every stud meter, you unlock the bonus level. The bonus level is the first part of A New Hope, just this time you're playing as Darth Vader and a Stormtrooper. It's a really cool level, but there is nothing to unlock in it. I love how Darth Vader is literally just an Anakin skin, I mean, it makes sense but this level will become useful later. Now that I have the bonus level complete and all the stud meters filled, now I can move on to collecting all the mini kits in every level. I unlock some of the mini kits while playing through the story, but for a lot of them, I'll have to go back in preplay mode and unlock them. So before I can do that, I'll have to purchase a dark side character so I can do the force on dark side objects. Finding all the mini kits throughout the levels on preplay mode is a lot of fun, going back to areas I previously couldn't get to because I lacked a certain character. You'll find so many secret rooms, or sometimes the mini kit will just be out in the open or you have to do a puzzle for it. This is probably one of my favorite parts when it came to 100% completing this game. It gets really addicting just trying to find everything. It is insanely satisfying when you collect them all. Now, when you collect all 10 mini kits in a level, you are given a mini vehicle that'll be outside in the parking lot. You can't drive any of them, but you always get this feeling of satisfaction when another vehicle is added to the collection. But collecting all 170 mini kits wasn't too hard and didn't really take that long. And if you're having any trouble with any of these, you can buy the mini kit detector extra, which I did use when I was able to purchase it. But after that, the only thing I have left to do is purchase everything in the shop. Getting all the characters is easy since they're all really cheap in this game. But when it comes to buying all the extras, it's a bit of a grind. There are no stud multipliers in this game, so it's not really that easy to get a whole bunch of studs. And most of the extras in this game are pretty expensive. So even though I had all the collectibles in this game, I had to keep replaying levels to save up enough studs to buy everything. I mostly replayed the bonus level because I found a strategy that would give me a lot of studs. But this made me play the game for a lot longer than I wanted to, and when there is nothing new to collect in these levels, it gives me no reason to want to play them. I eventually did buy everything and make it to 100% completion, but this game doesn't even have a percentage meter. I can prove that I have collected and done everything I can in this game. It sucks that there's no reward for 100% completion. 
Overall, LEGO Star Wars The Video Game is an amazing start to TT's LEGO video game series. Although it's very basic, when compared to most of the LEGO titles out today, there can still be a lot of fun had from this game. Getting 100% is super short, and is fun most of the way through until you have to start grinding for studs. But because of the complete saga, there is hardly any reason to go back to this game today. The only reason I can see people wanting to do that is to see what Dexter's Diner is like, or to use Yoda's chair. Anyways, I think it's time to move on. LEGO Star Wars 2 is a sequel to LEGO Star Wars the Video Game. It released on September 11, 2006, and is based on the original trilogy of Star Wars films. Whenever I think about LEGO Star Wars 2, that Control alt delete video always pops up in my head. Anyways, this game was again another huge hit for Traveler's Tales, so let's see how it holds up. Like the first game, LEGO Star Wars 2 starts right in the hub, this one being the most Isley Cantina, and this hub world is way more iconic than Dexter's Diner. This location was way more prominent in the fourth film, while Dexter's Diner was only in like a 60 second scene in a Star Wars movie that no one even likes. This hub of course gives you access to the shop, levels, and has an outside area just like the first game. But there are some new things here that are worth mentioning. We have a bounty hunter door that leads to bounty hunter missions, a character creator, and some bonus doors that I'll get to later. The character creator is insanely cool. You can choose from all the pieces of characters you have unlocked, and give them any weapon you desire. It's extremely cool cool, and you know most kids when playing with LEGO would mismatch all their figures. This is an amazing feature that only gets better with future titles. This hub world is great, it brings a cozy vibe, it makes you feel accomplished by showing you in fat bold text what percentage of the game you have complete. It makes you want to go out of your way to collect everything and get 100%. Even the bar filling out with all these characters you unlock just feels more special here. Like this is a bar and you'll never know who you're gonna bump into, anything can happen. This is an unforgettable hub, for not just LEGO games, but for games in general. It does exactly what it needs to do, be a nice and fun place for players to relax, but also gives you a reason to want to go back. Okay, that's enough gushing about the hub. How are the levels? The levels in this game are amazing. They are a huge improvement over the first game by a long shot. The levels are so much longer and action packed. The scale feels a lot larger, and overall, things are just rounded out better. Sure, the formula for the levels is pretty much exactly the same, but everything is far more fleshed out. More studs fall out of breaking objects, there are so many new levers and things to interact with, and the set pieces are far more detailed and larger. Everything just feels so refined and polished when compared to the first game. Something I really didn't pay much attention to when playing the first game is the camera. It works well in that game, but most of the time it would stay in the same position throughout the whole level and maybe every level feel the same. Literally on the first level, you can just see how improved the camera is. It's far more dynamic and changes often depending on the situation. Like if you're doing a shootout in a narrow hallway, the camera is right behind you making the action feel far more intense. Or if you're in a huge area needing to zipline across platforms and the camera will be really far away to give you all that space. Levels this time around are just more fun. The variety of settings is far better and in most levels you'll be going through different areas. Some levels just give you so much room to roam and explore. Even in story mode, I would just get distracted wandering around in these levels to see what I can find. I think the levels where you're inside of the spaceships was definitely some of my favorites. Just look at the most Isley spaceport level. It's absolutely amazing. In the levels, you do far more in comparison to the first game. Like in the level Betrayal Over Bespin, you start off by having to chase Boba Fett with lots of little puzzles and obstacles in your way. Then you have to save C-3PO, go outside, and find Han's ship and fight a load of stormtroopers so you can escape. This level has so much more depth than all the levels in the first game. My favorite levels in this whole game are definitely Rescue the Princess and Death Star Escape. These two levels are connected and can basically be one massive level by itself. Rescue the Princess has you disguising as a stormtrooper using the new helmet feature so you can find Princess Leia. Death Star Escape is this chaotic and massive level, where you're fighting huge waves of stormtroopers until you can get to Han's ship. I have memories as a kid where me and my brothers would get so many stormtroopers to spawn and just mess around. The only issue I have with this level is this stupid hover cart thing where I can get this hover cart and have to press all the buttons at the right time and you have to do it twice for some reason in this level. But yeah, these levels are honestly some of my favorites out of any LEGO game in general. I think they both showcase really well on how to make a fun LEGO game level. There are just so many little details in this game that show how much the developers cared and had fun while developing this game. Like how so many characters have items animations or can just dance. Chewbacca can rip Stormtrooper's arms off. And when filling up the stud meter, it now makes this cool sound that says true Jedi. Making it so satisfying and impossible to miss. In the first game, it would just happen and I wouldn't even know it. 
Characters in combat are mostly the same. There are some new abilities like bounty hunters being able to use bombs or stormtrooper panels, but pretty much everything feels like the last game. Of course, this game has tons of characters from the original trilogy, but if you have save data for the first LEGO Star Wars game, you can purchase an extra that gives you every character from that game. This makes the character selection absolutely massive, and it's such a cool feature. Except for on the Xbox 360 version, yeah, you have to purchase the characters, it's kind of dumb. In some levels, you can ride vehicles or animals. These are mostly used for puzzles, but it's a nice addition. Another new thing in this game is building. Yes, I know it's weird that something that's so well known about LEGO games was introduced in this second game, but building is so satisfying to do thanks to the amazing and iconic sound design. Boss fights aren't really improved on, this time they're just a lot longer, but something that is improved on are the spaceship levels. Spaceship levels are now in this isometric perspective, and you can now fly around freely. Your objective can vary depending on what level you are on. Sometimes you have to use torpedoes to destroy rockets in your way, or drag bombs so you can blow up an enemy. But to be fair, I still found these levels to be boring, even frustrating at times. Mostly the Hoff level because the bombs can just blow up so easily. The speeder level is kinda cool though, you're constantly switching between normal gameplay and spaceship gameplay, but the level is just way too long and overstays its welcome. The only level I really just straight up did not like in this game is probably Dagobog. The level is just so boring and long. The setting makes me want to fall asleep, the enemies are really annoying to hit, and most of the level is spent doing platforming. But that's one bad level out of 18. And to be fair, the level is isn't really that bad, I just find it to be insanely boring. Overall, playing through the story mode in this game is a really fun experience, and it's crazy how much every little thing was approved upon in the sequel. But now it's time to track down everything needed for 100% completion. So a new thing in this game is gold bricks. You unlock gold bricks from basically doing anything, like beating a level, getting true Jedi, getting all mini kits in a level, and much more. There are 99 gold bricks in this game. Extras in this game are quite different. Now to unlock an extra, you have to find a red brick. There are red bricks hidden throughout every single level. But in this game, one of the most game-changing extras that would forever change how people play LEGO games was introduced. The stud multipliers. There are so many more useful extras in this game as well that can speed up the process of getting 100%. There are 25 of them in this game, and buying all of them are required for 100% completion. There are 10 mini kits to be collected in every single level, and there are 18 levels in total, meaning there are 180 mini kits to collect. Stud meters also return, just this time there are two separate ones for free play and for story for some reason. So if you weren't able to get True Jedi on story mode, then you're just gonna have to replay the level on story mode, which is kind of annoying. Luckily, I got all the sub meters filled while playing the story mode, which just leaves me with the free play ones. Of course, buying everything in the shop is required for 100% completion, so unlocking all 68 characters, buying all hints, and buying all extras. Something that is new are bounty hunter missions. These will be unlocked after you purchase all of the bounty hunters. You basically have to find a character in a set amount of time, but once you complete one of them, you unlock a gold brick. And the last thing that is required for 100% is the episode bonus levels. After you complete an episode on story mode, you unlock three bonus levels for that episode. One of these is Super Story. You basically have to replay the whole entire story mode again, just with extras turned off. Character bonus is where you play in a stage and have to collect a million studs within a time limit. And mini kit bonus is where you have to play as one of those mini kit vehicles you've unlocked in a vehicle stage and have to collect a million studs within a time limit. Well, since I'm already talking about the bonus levels, I guess I'll talk about my experience with those first. The character bonus and mini kit bonus are fine. They're easy and harmless and over within a few minutes. But Super Story on the other hand, yeah, I am not a fan of. First off, why would I want to replay the whole entire story mode again just with extras turned off? I basically already did that while playing the main story of the game because I had no extras unlocked then. So you're basically making me replay the whole entire story mode just for nothing. But when you play this mode, they have a timer and a set amount of studs that they want you to collect. So what I first thought is that this means you had to beat it in a set amount of time and collect all those studs to get the gold brick. So when I played the first one, I was trying to rush through the level with no extras and at the same time making sure I have enough studs by the time I was near the end. And this stressed me out. It's not really hard, just like, why did I want to replay the whole entire story mode again just for a gold brick? But when I got to the third super story and didn't beat it in time, I was so scared I would have to replay the whole thing again. 
But no, it just gives you the gold brick. So this is literally just replaying the story mode just because the game needed some more content in it. Like these aren't bad, but they are completely worthless and don't need to be here. I feel like Super Story is only here just for the sake of having an extra mode. So while that sucked, at least I had a good time finding all the mini kits and bricks in the levels. Going through the levels and collecting everything in them was always super addicting. These levels are so massive and have so many secrets inside of them. The way you find these collectibles is the same as the last game, but it's still really fun. I got all the mini kits and red bricks pretty fast, but that brings up an issue. When I was done finding all the collectibles in the levels, I still had so much stuff I needed to buy in the shop, and that's because they made extras in this game cost a ton of money. I didn't really get to use any of the useful or fun red bricks while completing the levels, which always just annoys me. The levels are the main part of this game. So now that I have completed them all, the only thing left to do to earn money is just grind the levels I've already beat. It's not really that fun replaying levels when I've already completed everything in the levels, and it just got kind of tedious. So I just had to keep replaying levels over and over again until I could buy all the stud multipliers. But once I had the 6 times stud multiplier, it became easy to collect money in the hub. I eventually did buy everything in the shop after lots of grinding, but I later find out that all of that grinding was pointless because if I would have just beat the bounty hunter missions instead of saving them for last, I would have gotten the last gold bricks from them. And once you get all the gold bricks, you can build a stud fountain that endlessly rains studs. So if I would have done that, I wouldn't have wasted so much time just replaying levels I have already beaten. To be fair, this is kind of my own fault. But the bounty hunter missions were fun. They're not too long or difficult, and I would consider it good extra content in this game. I mean, at least it's more creative than the super story mode. Now, the only thing left for 100% completion was the bonus level. This one is called LEGO City, and it's super cool. This is what set the foundation of what a special level should be. It's just a small LEGO City, and a lot of the assets used here aren't seen anywhere else in the game. This makes this level feel like some sort of debug stage, especially of how open everything is. There is no real rhyme or reason to anything you're doing. Sometimes you'll be driving cars or spilling out Lego with a bunch of Lego pieces or watch a house magically float away for no reason. The whole point of this level is just destroy or find random secrets until you get a million studs. But this feels like a drip from a completely different game and it's so different from anything else you do, but I love it for that. It's really easy, but I could see why this level is so loved. Honestly, it's really replayable and just a fun level to mess around in. But after that is complete, I have fully 100% completed this game. After 26 hours. Now before I wrap things up, I do want to talk about some stuff I just couldn't quite fit into the review. This game introduces the extra toggle extra. It's really cool. In some levels, you'll get some exclusive characters when playing on free play mode, and this is an extra I wish they had in modern LEGO games. But to be fair, they don't really need it because in those games we get a ton of worthless characters just to buff up the character roster. And the last thing I wanted to mention was around Christmas time in 2006, the developers revealed two secret cheat codes that were in the game. These cheat codes would allow you to create Santa on the character customizer. It's a pretty cool little easter egg. But overall, LEGO Star Wars 2 was an amazing sequel that innovates the first game in a lot of ways. So many things that would become LEGO game staples were introduced here. This game was basically a second chance to prove that LEGO games can be something valuable and wouldn't just be another generic tie-in game. I appreciate this game a lot, but now it is time for me to see what Traveler's Tales would do next. Bionicle Heroes released on November 14, 2006, and was based on LEGO's constructible action figures, Bionicle. I'm not a Bionicle fan in the slightest, and don't even know anything when it comes to the lore, or even their names, but I felt like it would be important to talk about this game. After all, it was developed by TT, and it kind of is a LEGO game. I didn't even know about this game's existence until I did research for this video. Something that's crazy is this game released only a little over two months after LEGO Star Wars 2. Anyways, let's see how this game holds up. Starting off in the pause menu, you can see they all look pretty much the same as any other LEGO game. Well, once I start a new game, I am put straight into the hub. And you can see this game looks interesting. So while previous LEGO games had fixed cameras, this game decided to change that. Now your camera is stuck in a third person view, and your character is shoved to the left of the screen. The camera control feels alright but I'm mostly shocked by how different this is. Anyways, the hub world is called Matron Enclave. This is where you can access the shop and levels, but unlike any LEGO game before it, there is quite a bit to do here. You have the character showcase room. This area is where you can look at creatures you've unlocked by collecting certain collectibles. You can't do anything with them. They're all just kind of there doing their own thing while you just stare at them. I also just find it really disturbing. These things are just trapped in here. It doesn't feel right. The next area is the trophy cave. In here, you can look at multiple grids that 
that show off creatures, achievements, or collectibles you've unlocked. This wall fills out while you get 100%, and it's a good way to keep track of progress on certain tasks you need to do. Now the last area is called Paraka Playground, which I will save for later in the game because there's too much to go over with that. But this hub board is okay, it just feels extremely lonely in the main area because it's just you and the guy at the shop. But for some reason, the skybox and everything else will just get very red and dark for a few seconds. But when my game became bright again, it looked all smeared, like someone with greasy hands just touched the camera. It looks really ugly, but trust me, this is just how the game looks. All the issues with the screen made me think I needed to turn up the game's brightness or something. But once I opened the settings menu, my game's brightness and resolution got bugged out, and I learned to never go into settings for this game, at least on the PC version. I don't know if it's a problem because the game wasn't meant to be played on modern hardware, but yeah, if you played this game, just don't go into settings because you'll have to go to the game's script to fix it. But I guess it's time to talk about the actual gameplay. This game is a third person shooter that relies on auto aim, and the shooting feels okay. It just really depends on which Toa you are because all of them have different weapons and abilities. At the start of every level, you only have like two Toa, but as you explore and progress, you'll find a Toa mask on the ground, and once you collect it, a new Toa will be added to your party. You can switch between them anytime you want. During the story, you'll always have the same six Toa in every level. Some of them are clearly better than others, like there's this gold one and he just has this rocket launcher that sucks. It can't hit anything, and not to mention they are very slow. While with the red one, I could just hold down the shoot button and not even try, as they just automatically aim at everything. If I had to rank them based on what weapon they have, it would probably go like this. Red, black, blue, green, white, and then gold. Some characters are also just super slow, making me never want to be them. During gameplay, you'll be collecting Lego pieces that you can use to spend in the shop. But on levels, they fill up this meter, and once you fill it up, you are now in hero mode. Hero mode makes your character invincible, makes it where you can do more damage, and makes your character golden. It lasts forever until you have to build a gold Lego object. You can only build these in hero mode. Your character can do abilities, but they aren't really special, and they are only there to make it feel like the game has more depth to it. Like only this character can build Lego objects, or only this character can walk on water. A lot of them just feel very clunky, like the ability that makes you jump or climb walls. Each character also has a second ability that you have to unlock by upgrading your character. Upgrading your character is kind of an important thing about this game, but it's mostly forgettable because the upgrades are all kind of meaningless. Like they're just basic health and damage upgrades. You don't unlock a new weapon or anything like that, your character just feels the same. Most of the gameplay in this game is super shallow. Like in concepts, it sounds like it could be cool, but in execution, everything is just way too basic and repetitive. And the levels themselves are probably some of the worst I've seen in any LEGO video game. The setting in most of these levels are so generic. Like we have beach, jungle, volcano, or caves. Every single level is forgettable, ugly, and boring. The camera looks like someone smeared it with chicken grease. The levels are these really big areas filled with nothing but dead space, and the gameplay loop is so mind-numbingly boring. There are six different chapters in this game, and each chapter has four levels. The only real difference between the chapters is the settings they are in, because the levels follow the same format. The first level is just moving forward and then find a boss at the end. The second level is move forward until you find a green orb. The third Third level is move forward until you find a boss at the end, and the fourth level is just a very long boss fight that always ends up a mini boss fight. I'm not joking when I say every single damn level in this game plays out in that exact format. And these aren't just short levels, these levels are so long. To go into a bit more detail about the levels, you just walk around, occasionally switching your toa so you can do a minor task, then you must take out some enemies and destroy random objects so you can go into hero mode, and once you're in hero mode you have to build a gold object, and then you can move on. Repeat that process until you get to the end of the level. What makes this so much worse is that randomly during the levels you'll be forced to watch an establishing shot or an in-game cutscene. Like this game is already really slow, why would I want to be stopped to watch some stupid cutscene. The game doesn't challenge you at all, nothing about this game feels engaging. In the levels you're spending all that time doing nothing until you get to a boss fight. So are the boss fights worth it? No, it's basically exactly like the rest of the game, just this time you have to dodge attacks. Boss fights can play out in two ways, wait it out until their shield is gone so you can attack, or wait for enemies to spawn so you can defeat them and go into hero mode, and use a golden construct to attack them. Every single boss fight plays out like this, and it's just as boring as the rest of the game, especially the ones where you're just waiting around for enemies to spawn so you can go into hero mode, because sometimes enemies will take ages to 
spawn, so they're just sitting around doing nothing the whole time. Or the wave of enemies that do spawn don't give you enough Lego pieces to go into hero mode, so you have to wait around for the next one to spawn. Even the last boss fight in the game isn't all that special, and you can't fight them until you beat all six chapters. At least the credits is some cool dance party. Even though after I beat the story, when I was put back into the hub, I had this weird glitch where some of my characters didn't have a head, while the rest of them didn't even have arms or a body. But overall, this game's story mode and levels in general are so lifeless. None of it was fun from start to finish, which is making me dread going 100% completion. So let's track down what I need. There are five silver canisters and four gold canisters to collect in the first three levels of every chapter. In the last level, there are only four gold canisters. There are 25 levels in this game, so in total, 90 silver canisters and 100 gold canisters. Canisters are basically just mini kits, so that's 190 mini kits in this game. Getting all the silver canisters in a level gives you one of those creatures for your little zoo. Getting all the gold ones gets you a mask for the trophy wall. Buying everything in the shop is also required for 100%. The shop in this game is different because you can't buy extra characters in this game. Instead, you could only upgrade the characters you have, but there aren't any extras in this game. Instead, there is a goodies section. You can purchase some bonus levels, stuff for the Paraka playground, and something that just gives you 50% off everything in the shop. So of course, I would recommend buying that first. There are three bonus levels that need to be completed for 100%, and the last thing you'll need to do is complete every achievement in the trophy cave. Finding all the canisters in this game was easy. Most of the time, you'll have to use one of the abilities you unlock from upgrading your characters, or use the villain that you unlocked after completing the main story. None of them are hidden all that well, and you can purchase a canister detector in the shop, which makes it a bit easier. Of course, this process wasn't fun because the levels in this game are just so dreadful, but I eventually collected everything. Completing the bonus levels were really easy. All of them are just endless hordes of a certain enemy, and you have to defeat as many enemies as you can in a time limit. These aren't that bad, and they're really useful for grinding LEGO pieces in the shop. So once I had all the bonus levels purchased, getting everything in the shop became pretty easy. Which leads me to one more thing, getting all the achievements. Most of the achievements are defeating a certain amount of enemies as this Bionicle, or defeat a certain amount of this enemy. But something I didn't realize until very late in the game was on every level you are being ranked. I had no clue this was even a thing until I looked it up, but you must get a gold medal on every level. It's not clear at all how exactly you get gold, but most people say you just have to collect as many LEGO pieces as you can and try not to lose any mask. This means not only did I have to play almost every single level again after getting all the canisters, but this time I have to play the levels very slowly. These are already long levels by themselves, but if you take it slow, these levels can be up to 45 minutes. There would be times where I could get a ton of LEGO pieces at a level and still not get a gold ranking, but then I could play that same level again, getting less LEGO pieces, and that would somehow get me a gold ranking. It's such an unreliable system that can make your playthrough of this game very tedious and long. Sure, getting most of the achievements was pretty easy, but when it comes to the gold medal ones, they were absolutely awful. But I eventually got every single achievement and got 100%. For getting 100%, I am given a cutscene that's not even worth showing. Like, this could have just been something at the end of the game. Going for 100% completion in this game was honestly a chore. Playing this game in general is a chore. Even if I was a Bionicle fan, I don't think I would enjoy this game. Everything about it is so bland, and the whole time while playing it, you'll just want to be doing something else with your life. To be fair, getting 100% wasn't long, but it felt really long because of how awful this game is. But before I move on to the next game, there are some things I want to talk about. First, the Paraka Playground. In this area, all the Paraka you defeat during the story mode all go here. You can buy new things for your Paraka that they can interact with. You have to call them over and it plays a cutscene, and I guess these are kinda cool. I just wish these weren't locked behind barriers so I at least could pretend I was interacting with them. The next thing I want to mention is this game was originally supposed to be a first person shooter, which I can definitely see because at some points of the game, the settings just felt way too cramped for a third person view. The game's director and director for most of the LEGO games, John Burton, shared this early version on his YouTube channel. It looks okay. They had to change it because LEGO didn't want the game to have a T rating, but the DS version of the game would get a T rating and be a first person shooter. I don't think this game being in first person would have made it any better, but I thought it was a pretty cool thing to mention. Overall, Bionicle Heroes felt like such a weird direction to go in. After releasing two critically acclaimed, fun, and addictive games, you release something that's the exact opposite of fun and addicting. Critics were not nice on these games, and just thought it was way too soon after LEGO Star Wars 2 only releasing a few months prior. This is just a lifeless game that I'm never gonna play again, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. So let's move on to the next game.
Thank God this is the last Star Wars game in this video. It's crazy that TT released three LEGO Star Wars games basically back to back. But LEGO Star Wars Complete Saga released on November 6, 2007, and is probably one of the most well-known LEGO games of all time. This game being a combination of the first LEGO Star Wars games made basically everyone forget that the original ones weren't even a thing. And that includes me. As a kid, I had no clue this game was basically a re-release of two LEGO Star Wars games. LEGO Star Wars Complete Saga was my first ever LEGO game, and probably one of the first video games I ever played. Even though me and my brothers never really got far in it growing up, we have tons of memories playing it. Obviously, a lot of the content in this game is from the original two Star Wars games, so this review or retrospective of the game probably won't be as long as the others. But I will discuss all of the new features added to the game, because there is quite a lot, and honestly, it made this game worth the purchase. This game is an absolute monster when it comes to 100% because of all the stuff in it, so let's get things started. Much like the last two games, you start off in the hub. This one is a revamped cantina. It's a bit bigger, and a lot of doors were added here and there. The main difference with this one is the outside is different, and now you have a room dedicated to bonus levels. Overall, I like this one a lot. I have so many memories here, and it honestly just feels like a second home. It's so cool when you unlock loads of characters and watching them all walk around. I always loved when you turned off the music in the settings, the band stops playing music. It's such a nice detail. The outside area is nice. You could build this road thing that's completely worthless, and find a buildable that's begging for 160 gold bricks. This is a great and memorable hub, and I can see why it's burnt into so many people's brains. The levels in this game are the exact same levels from the first two games, but we did get a new level for episode 2, and this was originally scrapped due to time constraints. And all the spaceship levels in the prequels, except for one, were revamped to match the ones in LEGO Star Wars 2. The pod racing level was changed entirely, this time being a lot easier and not having to load in between areas. It just controls a lot better overall and is actually fun, but other than the things I mentioned, pretty much every level is the same, which isn't a bad thing at all. It's just a bit strange going through the prequel levels and into the original trilogy, because the levels are like double the length, making the prequel levels feel rushed. But since this game has so much stuff to it, let's just discuss what's needed for 100% completion. Starting off with the levels, there are 36 story levels in total, and in each level for 100% completion, you have to get 10 mini kits, 1 red brick, true Jedi, and 1 blue mini kit. You also get 3 gold bricks in a level. You get these gold bricks by beating the level, collecting all of the mini kits, and getting true Jedi, meaning that there are 360 mini kits, 36 red bricks, and 36 blue mini kits. Also, after completing each story, you unlock three bonus levels Super Story, Character Bonus, and Mini Kit Bonus. They have these for every single episode. You will also have to buy everything in the shop all 160 characters, 36 red bricks, all gold bricks, and every single hint. There are six bonus levels and 20 bounty hunter missions you have to complete for 100%. And while doing all of this, you'll be unlocking gold bricks, and there are 160 of them in total. Well, unless you're playing the iOS version. For some reason, they added some extra ones, so you collect 200 in that one. I'll start off with the levels first, because there's a ton of stuff to cover. When it came to the mini kits and red bricks, most of them were quite easy and fun to collect. I I think some of them are in different locations or the process of collecting it is a bit different, but you wouldn't notice it unless you're directly comparing them. I also got the stud meter filled while playing story mode in every level just so I could get that out of the way. Doing this took quite a while, but I really enjoyed it. It went by way faster because I already knew where everything was, but something that honestly doesn't need to be here are the new blue mini kits. When entering a level, you'll have a new option called challenge mode. In this mode, you play through the level, but this time you have to find 10 blue mini kits in 20 minutes. Once you find all 10, you are rewarded with one blue mini kit. I'm iffy on these. I do like there is some kind of special new mode that can be challenging, but at the same time, the story mode in this game is insanely long, and after playing that, then having to replay it all over again in replay mode, it's just way too much. Now I have to replay it for a third time just to do this. Like, it's such a worthless addition. It just feels like it's here to justify buying this game to the people who bought the first two games. But you'll have to be replaying the story mode for a fourth time too, because Super Story is back in this game for some reason. I didn't even know it was required for 100%, because the bonus level said there was two gold bricks to collect in them, and you get these two gold bricks by doing the character challenge and mini kit challenge, which are both really easy. So I played the whole game and got every gold brick and wondered, 
why don't I have 100%? And then I found out it's because a super story actually is required. All my complaints from the second game about this mode carry over to here. It doesn't need to be here, and making a replay to story mode with a timer isn't new content. If I wanted to replay to story mode, I could just do that, but forcing it for 100% completion is just dumb. Collecting everything in the levels is just as fun the first time I went through them, but two of the things required for 100% are just making this game feel like a drag and are making replay the levels so much, to the point where they all become tedious to me. But to be honest, as much as I dislike the super story and blue mini kids, I just couldn't see the complete saga without them. Remember, this is TT's fourth LEGO game, and it's really interesting looking back at them experimenting of all these different type of modes. And the complete saga is this ultimate game. It feels much bigger than LEGO Batman and a lot of LEGO games after it. So having these modes and tons of collectibles in a game that's already big just feels right. It's hard to explain it, but as much as I do think they really shouldn't be here, the complete saga wouldn't be the same without them. There are six more bonus levels unlocked as you collect more gold bricks. These bonus levels are the original pod race level from the first game, a cut level from the first game, the original Geonosis spaceship level from the first game, the bonus level from the first game, the bonus level from the second game, and a new bonus level called New Town. Now these range from pretty cool to just, yeah, that's just reused content from the first game. I do like how the original spaceship levels are here, I'm glad they're not completely scrapped, because then that would give you a reason to go back to the first LEGO Star Wars. I think making them as bonus levels make complete sense. The same can be said for the bonus levels that came from the first two games as well. The cut level is pretty cool. Although it's not really the original version, this one was made to match the style of this game. While the original one was an auto-scroller, which you can find gameplay of on John Burton's YouTube channel. But the new bonus level made for this game is probably one of the better bonus levels. It's similar to Old Town, but this time it has a lot more things to interact with, and it's just overall a lot better. It also helps that the new extra exploding bullets makes this extremely easy, but really fun. I like how they did the bonus levels. There's a lot of variety, and it encourages you to collect as many gold bricks as you can. Most of them are really replayable, and are a good excuse to get some content that would have been stuck on older games and put them here. Although this game doesn't have Yoda's share, and I have no clue why they didn't make it an option. So the only reason you'd want to replay LEGO Star Wars 1 is to use Yoda's chair or to see Dexter's diner. But next up are the Bounty Hunter levels, and my opinion on them are exactly the same. There are more of them, this time having 20, but I don't have anything new to say about them. Now that leaves me to buying everything in the shop, which was actually not a total grind in this game. I love LEGO games, where as you progress through the story and are near the end of the game, you already have some useful extras unlocked. It makes for a steady progression and can make going for 100% a lot less tedious. It feels good collecting as many sets as you can, knowing that you can buy a certain extra soon. Nothing was way too expensive, but not too cheap either, making it feel like a gradual progression. Although once you get every gold brick, you can build a stud fountain and it gives you every red brick for free, which is kind of odd. I already had every red brick, so it was completely pointless for me. But finally, after 30 hours, I have 100% completed LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga. Overall, this game is amazing and feels absolutely massive, with the huge character roster that includes Indiana Jones, an insane amount of collectibles and tons of things to do, and some of the highest quality levels ever put in a LEGO game, there's a reason why this game is looked back on so memorably. Despite how tedious it is, this game is one of the best LEGO games out there, and I highly recommend for everyone to check it out. But finally, I'm excited to get a break from the Star Wars franchise. LEGO Indiana Jones is the first LEGO game by TT not based on Star Wars, instead based on another Lucas property, Indiana Jones. This game was based on the first three Indiana Jones films, and it released on the 3rd of June in 2006, a couple of weeks after the fourth film. This has always been odd to me, Lucas Films even went up to TT and asked if they could develop an Indiana Jones game to release with the new film, and at the time they were starting development on LEGO Batman, and basically had to split the team into two to make sure both games would release on time. Time. But hey, I'm not complaining. The first three Indiana Jones films are great. When I was a kid, most LEGO games, including this one, were my first exposure to whatever franchise they were based on. Most of the time, I would play the game first, and then it would make me want to see the films that they were based on. But I think this game is a part of the original trilogy of LEGO games. LEGO Star Wars Complete Saga, LEGO Indiana Jones, and LEGO Batman. These three LEGO games are all great and very similar to one another. With titles after these ones, things would get a bit funky and experimental. But that's for another day. Let's check out this game. Unlike every LEGO game before it, you start off in the first level. This intro cutscene is burnt 
into my brain. Watching Indy just be oblivious to everything going on around him as all of his friends die. The comedy and slapstick humor has definitely gone up a notch since the last LEGO game, and it fits the whole LEGO game aesthetic so well. But after that cutscene ends, we are now on the first level, and probably one of the greatest levels in any LEGO game. This whole level is a thrilling intro to the game. First, you have to make your way through the jungle with lots of platforming, unique puzzles to solve, and booby traps. Then get on a small raft to avoid getting eaten by alligators, fight some spiders on the way, and then unlock the temple doors. This temple is filled with lots of traps and puzzles they have to solve with either a friend or your AI partner. Every single one is different as you get further through the temple, lots of them combining platforming and puzzle solving. Now you must find a key so you can make your way to the idol. A cutscene plays when you get to it, and I love how instead of a bag of money, it's instead replaced with the in-game currency. But now you must escape the temple as it's falling apart, swinging from vines, doing some more puzzles, and finally making it to the boulder chase. The boulder chase blew me away as a kid, and it still is really fun to this day. You're running towards the camera, so you don't know what's in front of you, making it feel even more intense. But once you escape, you must repair the plane while endless waves of enemies are attacking. And then the level ends. It's an action-packed intro that really can sell anyone to the game, and makes you want to continue that adventure. It makes you feel like you're going on an adventure. There are so many secrets and little easter eggs that often reward you for exploring, like uncovering a path in a waterfall, or falling off a ledge and finding a secret. From the start of the game, it encourages you to just explore these levels from top to bottom. And I can say all of this just about the first level. This game has some of the highest quality levels I've seen in a LEGO game, each of them being so memorable and adventurous. I don't think there was a single level that I ever dreaded playing. Every single level was massive, but you don't stay in one section for too long. You're always moving, making sure you're never bored. Just the level design and the way you navigate levels is a huge improvement. The camera in some areas is a lot further back from previous LEGO games, but they do this because in a lot of levels you have complete freedom to go up or down, making the possibilities and what you can do in a single level almost endless. Going up in a LEGO Star Wars game most likely meant you had to wait on an elevator, or used a Jedi to double jump. But this game has new climbing sections where you feel like you're holding on for your life. The characters in this game are human, so their jumps just have a lot more weight to them, and honestly made all the platforming way more intense, but also fun. Like sometimes you have to be accurate with your jumps, or else you risk having to restart a puzzle or platforming section. There are also new swinging mechanics in this game. You can swing on vines or ropes, and you have to move your character to gain momentum. These vines are quite often used for puzzles as well, like having both characters hang on one to unlock a door, or hang on one to find a hidden key. When it comes to any type of platforming, this game innovates a ton with the range of stuff you'll be doing. The characters in combat are amazing in this game and are pretty different from the LEGO Star Wars games. Sure, it's just mindlessly fighting enemies, but the combat here just feels so much smoother. Instead of fighting droids or stormtroopers in this game, you'll be mostly fighting other humans. When you're not holding any weapon, your character will use their fists, which feels great. There's so much impact to every hit. Each time you land a blow, the character you're fighting has an animation to react with it, and sometimes when you defeat an enemy, your character will do a unique finisher. The game also introduces a new item mechanic. You can pick up any weapon or thing you see on the ground, and use it to help aid you in combat. Obviously, guns and swords are the most useful, but guns only have a limited amount of use, so you have to use them at the right time. But anything you can grab, like a shovel, wrench, or even a banana, it can be used as a weapon. This can really force you to be experimental in combat scenarios. Indy's whip can be used in combat. He can disarm a gun from an enemy's hand or whip them towards him so he can take them out. Or if your AI character is a female character, Indy can whip them towards him for a kiss. There are tons of new mechanics that are used throughout the levels. Talking about them all in detail would just take way too much time. So I'll just list the ones I noticed while playing. Repairing, screaming, whip, sneaking on walls, phobias, picking up boxes, digging, monkey trading, keys, climbing ladders and ropes, boats, army disguises, book puzzles, and grabbing weapons. There are probably a few that I miss, but there are so much new stuff in this game that just helps LEGO and Nina Jones stand out from previous LEGO games. This doesn't feel like a reskinned LEGO Star Wars game, but a whole new game entirely, just using the same formula. The game has such an adventurous atmosphere. The entire story mode is a blast. 
every single level brings you to a new setting with lots of different challenges. Like every single one of the chapters in this game truly feels like an adventure. In some levels you'll be fighting enemies on a moving vehicle, and in the next one you'll be solving different puzzles. This game truly perfected mashing up the action and puzzle solving. In every level you'll be manipulating the environment and experimenting to move on. Like oh you need this key to unlock a door, but the monkey stole the key and will only give it to you if you give him a banana. But the bananas are closed behind this wall of rubbish, so you had to find another way around it. Every level has that mindset with all kinds of different puzzles, and it honestly never gets old. Overall, the levels in this game are phenomenal. Pretty much every single one of them are memorable, and there isn't any bad or boring ones. They all flow so nicely together, making this one of the best story modes to go through from start to finish. Which you would be surprised by how many LEGO games can't do that or at least fumble a bit. But now I think I should move on to the hub. In this game, it is Barnett College, which in the film is the university at Indiana Jones teaches at. I do like this hub a lot, and I think having it be in the college was a perfect choice. There are multiple different rooms you can enter, each one having the usual things you expect, like the levels, shop, red brick shop, and character customizer. But one of my favorite things about this hub is the artifact room. It fills out more as you collect mini kits, and this is also where the secret levels are. Just I love the whole vibe of this hub and how there are students walking around. It's just a nice place to relax when you're not going on adventures. Now I think it is time to go over what I need for 100% completion. There are 18 levels in this game, each level has a red parcel which is just a red brick, there are 10 artifacts to find in the levels which these are just mini kits, and you have to fill the stun meter on every level. So you have to collect 18 red bricks, get true adventure on every level, and find all 180 mini kits and that's all for the levels. Of course you have to buy everything as well, so purchasing every extra in all 83 characters. Then the last thing needed for 100% is to unlock and complete all three of the bonus levels. And that's it. Now when it comes to collecting everything in the levels, it was a lot of fun. Almost every single level has a ton of hidden secrets and rooms to find, and exploring them with whole new characters can just be a lot of fun. None of it ever got tedious or annoying, and since these levels are just so great in general, it was a really good time. The progression wasn't bad either, since everything in the shop was decently priced, so I was pretty much zooming through this game. I think my favorite part about going through freeplay mode is finding secret rooms, and this game delivers on that. There are Star Wars characters you can find by exploring, and once you find all of them, you unlock Han Solo, which is super cool since Indiana Jones was in the complete saga, but it also rewards you for exploring, which is just something I really appreciate. The mini kit rewards in this game are artifacts, which will be displayed in the artifact room. This is something I adore, and it's nice seeing it fill out. When it came to buying everything, that was pretty easy. Like I said, the progression of this game is good and well balanced. So now the only thing I have left to do is play the secret levels, and they are pretty good in this game. Ancient City is this massive level kinda similar to LEGO City in LEGO Star Wars. You can test out tons of different abilities, ride lots of vehicles, and even be an archaeologist. The whole point is to get a million studs. Although it can be kind of confusing on what to do sometimes, I overall enjoyed it. The next one is Young Indy, and this is definitely one of my favorites. This is based off the start of the third movie, and you get whole new cutscenes and everything. It's honestly super cool, and it's perfect for a bonus level. It plays pretty much like every normal level in the game. The train section is amazing. You can even go back and play this level on free play, but there isn't any collectibles. The last secret level is called Warehouse, and it's honestly kind of disappointing. It's just another one of those levels where you destroy stuff until you get a million studs, but it's all just kind of empty. There is so much dead space, and it just feels like this is just a test room for LEGO Indiana Jones 2, because the background and setting is from that game. The only thing I like about this level is the exploit you can do to beat it super fast. But after that, I have now 100% completed LEGO Indiana Jones, and it did not take long at all, even less time than LEGO Star Wars 2 did. The 100% reward of this game makes it rain studs throughout the whole college, which is kind of worthless, but at least it has a reward. Overall, LEGO Indiana Jones is one of my favorite LEGO games of all time. I had a blast going for 100% and didn't have any complaints the whole way through. This game is a great step forward for LEGO games, and I wish it got talked about as much as LEGO Star Wars or LEGO Batman, but I highly recommend a lot of people check this game out. Going for 100% doesn't even take that long, but now it's time to move on.
LEGO Batman a video game released on September 23rd, 2008, only a bit over three months after LEGO Indiana Jones, which is absolutely crazy how fast they were able to pump these games out. But when LEGO Batman first released, it wasn't doing amazingly sales-wise, and I think it was due to LEGO Indiana Jones literally just having released not long ago. There's even this IGN review back when this game released, and my god, it is one of the worst IGN videos I've ever seen. And as low reaching as Killer Moth. Now you remember Killer Moth, right? Yeah, me neither. Apparently, he's a moth that likes to kill people. But soon things would change. Over Christmas time, Lego Batman became the pack and bundle. It came packed in with a copy of Pure, which is an interesting choice, but it would also be packed in with a bunch of Xbox 360s, which made it a perfect bundle for kids. This actually inspired them to do the same thing with Lego Indiana Jones, and they would pack it with Kung Fu Panda. But because of it being the holidays and it being packed in with Xbox 360s, Lego Batman a video game would go on to sell insanely well. Anyways, I love Lego Batman a video game. Out of the three OG Lego games, me and my brothers definitely put the most time into this one. Let's start the game. The intro credits in this game are amazing. It's a recreation of the Batman the Animated Series intro, but now in Lego. It makes this game feel a lot darker than all the ones that released before it, and every time I start the game, I would never skip it. It shows off the tone of this game very well, and it's something that most people would probably just skip. This press start screen is iconic. Batman watching over the city with his cape flowing in the wind, as Robin is, you know, doing his thing. But let's actually start the game. Like Indiana Jones, this game starts off with a cutscene. This is the first LEGO game, if you don't count Bionicle Heroes, to not be based off of a movie. So this game chooses to tell its own story. It's not anything amazing, it's basically just all of the villains have escaped Arkham, now Batman has to go and stop them. But they went all out with the style in all these cutscenes. They're all still filled with comedy, but things just feel darker. Which is most likely due to the overall dark, but eye-catching aesthetic in Gotham. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely the best cutscene in the whole entire game. After the cutscene, the game drops you right into the level. But before I go on about the levels, this game handled them in such a cool and unique way. So there are 30 levels in this game. You may be thinking, wow, that's a lot. But after you complete a chapter as Batman and Robin, you unlock the ability to replay that story, but this time from the villain's perspective. So you get 15 levels for the heroes and 15 levels for the villains. And oh my god, this is so cool. They could have easily have made it just to replay the same level just as the villains, but they completely redesigned these levels for them. Like as the heroes, you may be trying to get inside of the bank to stop a robbery, but as the villains, you'll be making your way to the bank and then later breaking into it. Hell, they even made whole new cutscenes for the villains. These weren't just last minute ideas. Why doesn't TT Games do this now? This is such a unique feature. Now let's talk about the levels themselves, and yet again, this game delivers. Levels are really similar to the style of Lego Nina Jones. Obviously, just the setting, puzzles, and characters are completely completely different. Instead of this game relying a lot on platforming, puzzle solving becomes the main focus. Levels are far more linear and straightforward, but you get a bit more freedom in how you choose to get there, like using your grapple hook to get to rooftops, and traveling that way to avoid any obstacles, or switching between Batman and Robin to use their abilities and work together to find a path that accommodates for both of them. The big new feature that is only in LEGO Batman games is the ability to switch between suits. Batman and Robin can find the multiple different suits throughout the levels. Most of the time, the suit will help you if the next barrier your way. But what I love about it is all of the puzzles you'll be doing between both of the characters. Batman and Robin don't have the same suits and will have to work together using their suits abilities. This makes this game one of the best LEGO co-op games, because most of the time both players will have something they need to be doing. I love how it encourages you both to work together like an actual crime fighting team. It makes sense for every level to be focused on puzzle solving. It makes you feel like an actual detective and gives this game its own personality. The combat in this game is pretty much the same as Indiana Jones, but it is a a lot of fun to beat up a big horde of goons. There are two new things though, the ability to target enemies using your batarang, and grabbing. Using your batarang is super satisfying, just taking out a bunch of goons from afar and watching it return, but grabbing
grabbing is definitely one of my favorite additions. Most characters have their own unique grabbing animations, and they have two different animations depending on what button you press. These animations look amazing and capture the styles of the characters so well. The game's style and aesthetic is such its own thing. Not even future LEGO Batman titles could replicate it. These levels feel so dark and depressing. The buildings are monochrome, but the city is glowing with lots of lights, from street lights or neon signs. The levels color important things in big bright colors that get your attention, and help clue you in on what you should be doing. Most levels take place on the streets, in the sewers, or on top of buildings, and it makes Gotham feel massive. By the time you have completed the campaign, you would have walked through tons of different locations. Interiors in this game always stand out. Most of them feel so mechanical and bright, literally the opposite of how Gotham looks outside. Honestly, this game's style is still unmatched to this day. It makes it fun to just pop into a level to experience this Gotham. And when you compare how these levels look with the LEGO Batman sets that were out at the time, man, they captured it so well. I own some of the 2006 sets, and these things are a beauty and feel like they're ripped right from the game. It's super cool seeing these actual LEGO sets being used in the game. And I'm not just talking about vehicles. The lights in the Batcave are literally the same build from the Arkham set. Now when it comes to the villain side of things, yeah, these levels feel like they could be from their own game. The levels are just so much brighter, with a lot of the buildings being a lot brighter, and overall everything just looks so colorful. I do love how they did this. It keeps both sides of the story feeling totally unique from one another, but it's also something that could be looked into a lot deeper. Like the heroes see things for how they are, but the villains get enjoyment from the things they are doing. I don't know, maybe I'm just looking far too into it, or I just need to get my eyes checked. But just playing these both back to back, they felt like two different takes in the same area. So since the villains don't have any suits, instead you have to use their abilities to navigate the levels. And it just makes these levels feel so fresh. I mean in most of them, you are seeing completely different areas. Things all just come together in the end, so we will get to see how these intertwine. It would be cool if someone modded the game and combined these levels making them absolutely massive free roams. Not sure if that's possible, but it would be pretty damn cool. Most of the villains all have abilities exclusive to them, like Poison Ivy being able to get people a poison kiss, or Mr. Freeze being able to freeze people. In most LEGO games these days, you would be lucky if at least half the character roster was unique. But in this game, most of the characters are so unique from each other. There are a couple of reskins, like Hush just being Two-Face, but the characters in this game are one of the best parts. Most of them have their own fighting animations and just little details that ooze this game with charm. Like the Penguin's little waddle, Two-Face flipping a coin whenever he stands still, and Bane being able to do his iconic backbreaker move on enemies. Just so much time and effort went into this character roster, making sure every character has a personality and were accurate to the comics. Batgirl and Nightwing even have their own suits made for them, like they did not need to put this much detail into a game that already feels so alive and lived in. Somehow I haven't mentioned this, but there are some vehicle levels. They can either take place on the streets of Gotham, in the skies, or in the water. And these are okay. Most of them just get quite repetitive after a while, but there are only three vehicle levels for each side of the story, so they don't really ruin the game for me. And I think that's all I have to say about the story mode of this game. It's a great package that feels like it's its own thing. It was hard to get bored throughout both story modes, and I always catch myself wanting to go back. I don't think the levels are as amazing or action packed as Indiana Jones, but I think just the tone and atmosphere alone can sell anyone onto this game. The level are its own thing, and I really appreciate that. But now it's time to talk about the hub. There are two of them in this game, the Bat Cave and Arkham Asylum. Both of these are very memorable. In the Bat Cave, you can test out different suits and access the shop in the computer room. The vehicle room is where you can access all the levels. It's really cool seeing these vehicles from the set so up close. Or you can go up to the Wayne Manor to access the trophy room so you can view mini kits and access the bonus levels. The Batcave is so calm and quiet, there are only 5 characters walking around it. Obviously, everyone beat up on Alfred as a kid. Now, the Arkham Hub is basically the opposite of the Batcave. There are tons of dangerous villains walking around, goons constantly fighting each other, and just complete chaos. In the main room, you can hack into the Bat computer, so you can access the shop. You can go outside and see all the vehicles parked that brings you to missions. There is the trophy room, which serves the same purpose as it did for the heroes. And finally, the experiment room, which is where you can create your own hero or villain. I love how just like the missions, these two hubs have completely different vibes to them. But now it is finally time to talk about everything you need for 100% completion. So there are 30 levels in this game, 10 mini kits, 1 red brick, 25 hostages, and you have to fill up the stud meter in every level. So that means there are 300 mini kits and 30 red bricks, 
and the other things I just mentioned to finish the levels. Buying everything in the shop is always going to be required for 100%, and beating the two bonus levels in this game. Now getting 100% in the levels was a lot of fun, but since the levels in this game are a lot more straightforward, there wasn't a whole lot of secret areas to find. I think it's because they already made so many extra areas in the levels, because they had two different stories to tell. So it makes sense. I still enjoyed my time doing it. It was really addicting and the progression felt good. But everything in the shop was quite easy as well. You can't buy two things until you get 100%. One being a hint and the other being a character. The hints are actually pretty cool for once. They fill you in with a lot of the lore and it's crazy seeing Superman being mentioned. I love how the extras you unlock in the hero levels are all suit upgrades for them. It's really unique. But yeah, buying everything in the shop was pretty easy. So all I'm left with now are the bonus levels. And yeah, both of these suck. The one for the heroes is Wayne Manor, and it's mostly just confusing. They have this part where you enter this 2D side scroller and it's really easy to miss a lot of stuff in there. The villains is just a bunch of random stuff thrown together in what's supposed to be Arkham Asylum. They have this awful controlling ball section that's super annoying to control, and the physics for the balls themselves suck. Yeah, I hated both of these levels. You just have to get a million stunts to beat them both. And now that is 100% completion in LEGO Batman the video game, and thankfully there are some pretty cool rewards. You'll be stuck at 99% until you buy the last hint, which costs the max amount of studs you can collect. The hint is just teasing a sequel, but once you have 100%, you unlock Rasha Ghoul and a couple of secret characters you can build in the customizer. Rasha Ghoul is okay. He looks cool, but he's just a Nightwing skin. The custom characters, on the other hand, are really cool. Asriel, Huntress, Black Mask, and a spoiler. It's really cool they gave us the option to make these characters, and it makes it for one of the better 100% rewards. Overall, Lego Batman the video game is an absolutely amazing game. The aesthetic and world is one of my favorites from any LEGO game, and it's a game I could always go back to. I love how this game stands out a lot from LEGO Indiana Jones and Star Wars. I highly recommend for everyone to play this game. Finally, this took ages to make, but I've basically only just started. Today, I 100% completed 6 LEGO video games. These early years for LEGO games were so interesting and new. Everything was still fresh, but at the same time, they still proved that they can make their games feel different from one another. LEGO Star Wars feels nothing like Bionicle Heroes, LEGO Indiana Jones, or LEGO Batman, and there is something just so special about that. They could have easily have made these games all pretty much the same, but they all always push to have these worlds feel different from one another, but this is only just the beginning. I have 21 games left, and they pretty much only get bigger from here. In these games, I have collected 1,416 mini kits, 119 red bricks, 468 characters, 259 gold bricks, and completed 145 levels. Oh my god, I am so tired. I can't wait to see how high that number is by the time I'm done with this. Anyways, if you're looking forward to see what it's like 100% completing the rest of the LEGO games, I would consider subscribing. But thank you so much for watching.